Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session on the fuel of the future. What will we run on? And I think of this panel as an opportunity to integrate some of the things that you've been probably hearing. So for those of you who are energy buffs or just have been paying a lot of attention to the energy track of the Aspen Ideas Festival, you've probably heard a number of trends in the energy world. First, you've probably heard a lot about renewable energy and the very significant gains that renewables have made in recent years, whether it's solar power or wind power. You've probably heard about the virtual revolution in natural gas, particularly in the United States. And you've probably been reading the newspapers and are aware of President Obama and his recent climate speech in which he talked again about the importance of getting off foreign oil. And of course, he is not the first American president to do this, but every president since Nixon has made it a priority. So an intelligent observer, I think, would be forgiven for thinking, well, all these things are moving in the right direction and that they're all going to complement one another. We're going to have advances in alternative energies. That's going to help us get off foreign oil. The reality, and in fact, is something different. And the reason for this is essentially transportation. That advances in alternative fuels do not necessarily mean decreasing our dependence on foreign oil. And let me give you a few statistics to explain that. Um, the world still relies on oil-based derivatives for more than 80% of all transportation, if you look at land, sea, and air transportation together. And if we look at the United States and we look at just road-based transportation, uh, cars and trucks in America run on 96% of their fuel is oil petroleum based. And so really the reality is you can make all the advances in renewables and we do see changes in our energy mix, um, but they won't affect our dependence on foreign oil unless we get at the transportation sector. And this won't be a mean feat. This is something that is very unlikely to happen on its own. It's going to require advances in technology, changes in policy, and pretty adept strategies. So for those reasons, and to, to discuss that today, we have a great panel here. Um, I'll introduce them to you briefly. We have Dan Sperling, who is a professor and the founding director <coughs> of the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of California at Davis. We have JC Chitwood, who is a manager of the Advanced Technology Group at Toyota. And we have Neil Golightly, who is a vice president of external affairs at Shell Upstream America. So what we're going to do is have a little bit of a conversation here. Uh, I'm going to talk about technologies and then strategy and policy, and then we'll open it up to you. And I'm looking forward to your questions and comments and interrogations of our panelists. So um, let me begin with you, Dan, and ask you just to lay the scene for us a little bit on technologies. Give us a sense of the landscape of what kind of technologies um, could allow us to use alternative fuel and transportation and maybe a little bit of their, their pros and cons now that I've laid out that in fact, we are using oil for 96% of our transportation needs here in America. All right, so you've asked me to condense 10 books and uh, <laughs> hundreds of lectures into five minutes. That's the Aspen I can, Festival. I can do it. <laughs> All right, so when we talk about alternative transportation fuels, we usually think that there's four leading options, and those are biofuels, electricity, hydrogen, and natural gas. So let me just give a quick little overview of each of those. Let me start with natural gas, which is the easiest. Uh, in a sense, it's a, it is a fossil fuel. It's been around a long time. It's been used in vehicles for many, many years and, and other, other parts of the, of the world especially. Um, the problem with it, so all of this, everything we talk about, when we talk about alternative fuels, we need to look at the application. So it's good to break it out in terms of light duty vehicles, cars and light trucks, heavy trucks, planes, ships, railroads. We're going to, I think we're going to focus here mostly on light duty vehicles, but, and a little bit on heavy duty. So what we're going to learn is that with natural gas, it's, not gotten much traction, much, uh, probably not the right word. <laughs> uh, it's not appealed very much to the consumer market for a variety of reasons. Um, it does look very attractive in the heavy duty market. That's where most of the attention is in terms of trucks. 
The price, right now, the price is very good. The cost is very low in the United States, not everywhere, but in the United States, certainly. And it looks like it's going to happen. Now, when we think about why are these options going to happen or how are they going to happen, we probably want to look at it in terms of environmental factors. And I'll give that a quick overview on that. Um, but what we're going to, and all of these provide attractions. All of these options I just talked about have uh, environmental attractions. But an, another way of looking at it is cost. And every single one of them requires either more cost for the vehicle or more cost of the fuel that's being used in that vehicle. So right off the bat, that's the answer why it's not happening faster. So that's kind of an easy first cut at it. Um, the other part is all of them require an infrastructure, a fueling infrastructure out there uh, to provide the fuel so that if people are going to buy a car, they're not, you're not going to buy a car or a truck unless there's a place to refuel it, right? So you need a fueling infrastructure. And then probably the third uh, level is the consumer acceptance issues that come along with it. So going back to natural gas, so that pretty much is uh, the cost is a little less. The consumer acceptance is a little difficult because the fueling infrastructure is not out there uh, widely yet. Uh, and from an environmental perspective, it's a little better. It tends to be a little better than gasoline. Uh, greenhouse gases look like they're a little better, although we're, as we learn more about natural gas with leakage and so on, that might change our understanding. But right now, we think it's about 20% better. The, air, the local air pollution, it's about the same, a little better. So from a policy perspective, we don't get real excited about natural gas for environmental reasons. We could for, for, for energy security. So then we come to biofuels. Now biofuels in many ways is a tricky one because it can be made from so many different kinds of materials. Right now we mostly make it from corn in the US and sugarcane in Brazil. And there's a lot of thinking and, and, and I'm part of it that says it's crazy to be using food to make energy, especially when there's so many other ways of making, making the, the biofuels, waste materials, best of all, cellulosic, algae and so on. Um, but it's easy to put into the vehicle, so the automakers like biofuels because it's just a minor tweak, uh, a few dollars and, you know, ready to go. Third is elec electricity. So electricity, again, can be made from almost anything, just like hydrogen. And we have a, an established electricity grid system. We have electricity in our homes. And so the infrastructure side is not so difficult relatively easy. The problem really there is the batteries. The batteries are still expensive and, and heavy and, so, and, and don't have a lot of dense energy density. So you need a large number of batteries to be equivalent to a gallon of gasoline. And, and, and as I said, the most important part is the batteries continue to be expensive, although they're coming down at a, a pretty good clip. And then we have hydrogen. And again, hydrogen can be made from almost anything. So George Bush II uh, was, had embraced uh, hydrogen about 10 years ago as the fuel of the future. And there was a lot of excitement about it. Arnold Schwarzenegger also, the European Union. And what I think really slowed them up is the infrastructure issue. And that's why there was a shift more towards electricity. And I call, these, I call this whole phenomenon the fuel du jour phenomenon. We jump from one to another because every one of them is difficult, but we create so much hype uh, by the media, by, um, by you know, the public, um, and the politicians for these different options that they never meet the hype. And so we get disappointed and we go to another one. And that's essentially what, what, what's happened with all these options. All these options have had their day in the sun. And right now, electricity is the one having its day in the sun. And so with hydrogen, it's very attractive. In many ways, many of the car companies prefer uh, hydrogen because they see it as a, uh, as a fuel with a fuel cell technology that uses it that doesn't have the range issues and the cost issues of batteries in the long term. So there's a lot of enthusiasm for hydrogen fuel cell vehicles. 
but the big challenge there is the infrastructure. And so one of my other jobs is I'm a board member of the California Air Resources Board. And in California, we're trying to get the hydrogen infrastructure out there. The state of California is strongly behind it. Um, but getting someone to commit to building the stations when there's no business model has been rather difficult, let's say. And, uh, and so the state has been getting more involved in it. So that's kind of the uh, um, five Thank minute you. or so no, that's overview. Great. Thank you for <laughs> laying the landscape for us. Um, JC, let me turn to you and ask you to give us an automotive industry perspective. How does Toyota or the industry more generally look at these different technologies and how do you make decisions? How do you choose between these technologies and where you're going to make investments and bets for the future? Um, thank you both for setting this up really well. So <laughs> um, you've covered a lot of the bases. Um, so the way the auto industry looks at the choices amongst these fuels is um, the, end, the end is the consumer, sort of the beginning and the end is the, con is the consumer. So what goes, um, the factors that go into that consideration are some of the things um, that Dan mentioned, the cost. What is the cost of the technology? What is the cost of the technology or the price of the technology going to be the consumer? Will the consumers um, accept it? Um, what is the fuel availability? Will the infrastructure be there? Um, what, is the, what is the technology uh, development status and pathway? So for batteries, um, I think no one would argue that they're not there yet. Are they going to be there? So, I mean, the investment decisions that the auto industry makes are, are tens, 20s of years. Um, it takes about 20 years for the total vehicle fleet to turn over. Um, a new model takes you know, about 10 years, five to 10 years um, to develop, and that's not even talking about a new fuel or a new um, vehicle type. And then when you do introduce that model, you want it to have at least you know, several generations, and you want it to sell in hundreds of thousands of vehicles per year sustainably. So, so that's sort of the metric is will this uh, fuel vehicle system Will it be affordable enough to consumers? Will they be able to fuel it? Um, and will there be a sustained market over many years and many vehicle generations? So amongst those options, um, Dan did correctly say that we are, we are most, um, I guess, excited, cautiously excited about, about hydrogen fuel cell vehicles because uh, um, they don't have some of the limitations that we're experiencing with uh, battery electric vehicles, such as limited range, which we which is a big deterrent to cus uh, customer acceptance, and also just the recharge time, that, um, recharge time and just the fact of having to plug in your vehicle. We're seeing a real sort of market unwillingness um, beyond the price, so that the price is higher. Um, so beyond the price, um, the range and the recharge time are the biggest deterrents, um, which hydrogen fuel cell vehicles uh, don't have. You can fuel at any station in five minutes, just like a regular car. Um, has the range of a regular car. It is going to be more expensive though. Um, and I think, I think what you said at the beginning is really important, which is um, none of these are going to happen on their own. And as Dan said, this jumping from technology du jour to technology du jour isn't going to enable any of these to take, um, to take hold because it will take decades. Um, it will take decades of vehicle generations, you know, getting people um, comfortable with this technology. We've been selling hybrids now in this, in this country for about 13 years. Um, they do really well in California, but not so, <laughs> not so well elsewhere. Uh, I don't know about Aspen, but I think Portland probably still outsells you in terms of um, Prius sales. But they're still only 3% of the market. So, and you think about that's a technology that... Over 13 years. Over 13 years. So 3% of the market. And people didn't have to change their behavior. They went to a regular gas station. So there's really um, that consumer piece is, I think, the most um, often the most overlooked, and that will consumers accept this and adopt this and, and embrace it. So um, it's going to take concerted efforts across many stakeholders and really a, a long-term sustained strategy to get there. Um, before we move to Neil, and without asking you to give us any Toyota secrets. Um, can you say a little bit more about, so Toyota's cautiously optimistic about hydrogen fuel cells. What is What is that meant in practice? What are you investing in? And how, how should we as consumers uh, expect to see this cautious optimism translated into your vehicle fleet? 
So the PR folks here are probably killing me for saying <laughs> cautious, <laughs> cautious. But um, what it, and the reason I say cautiously optimistic, optimistic is because of the infrastructure challenge. Um, this, you know, we're working with the state and other states to, to try to get those stations out there because we're we're not going to be able to sell vehicle one if if the stations aren't out there. Um, I mean, we're in terms of investment, we've not been cautious. We've been developing we're developing that technology for close to 20 years, and you know, invested safe to say billions of dollars. Um, so we're not cautious about the technology itself, we're just um, cautious about the expectations given the infrastructure limitations. Um, and I, again, thank you, Dan, for talking about this hype cycle and, um, you know, there's just some real dose of reality needs to be um, surround any of these technologies, which is they're going to be expensive at first, the price will come down, um, it'll take multiple generations for people to get comfortable with the technology. Um, sort of we're in this for the long haul, and um, so that's so my ca the cautiousness, cautiousness um, is because of the infrastructure piece. Okay, great. Um, Neil, let me move to you. And despite the fact that Neil and JC are sitting up here happily and uh, collegially, there, there are tensions between the oil and gas industry and the automotive industry on this issue of transportation and what the fuel of the future is going to be. Maybe you could talk to us a little bit both about how decisions are made within the oil and gas industry and perhaps Shell in particular, which is a, a company that has made a lot of investments in uh, procuring gas, actually extracting gas. Um, and maybe say a little bit about, is there coordination between the oil and gas industry and the automotive industry on this particular issue? Absolutely. So, so thanks for that. Uh, and um, I think what's already interesting is the different ways of framing up the challenge even across this panel. So very much kind of looking at an analysis of the different fuels from a policy framework, very much from a consumer framework. We tend to look at it from a kind of a, a starting with a larger energy framework and kind of the basic sort of 30 second version of that is energy demand growing uh, as a product of population growth and not just numbers of population, but the expectations of that population. More and more people wanting the kinds of things that energy drives, vehicles, computers, washing machines, everything. So we're looking at that picture of energy demand growth in a, in a, in a big way. Uh, and all along with that, of course, is the, is, the, is the fact that some of the challenges associated with energy, especially climate, but also water, also food, um, are very real uh, and they have to be addressed. So if we kind of start with that framing and then look at mobility to get closer to, to this topic, mobility is a big part of that energy framework. Uh, and and it, mobility takes as much as a quarter of, of uh, the energy that's produced in the world. Um, something like 6 to 12 percent of GDP in, uh, in developed countries uh, is a product or, or dependent on mobility. Uh, if you look at just the travel and transport industry, something like 3 percent of all jobs in the world are dependent on travel and transport. Uh, $16 trillion worth of goods that go by some form of transportation, marine, truck, rail, and so forth. So mobility, we, the, the, kind of the way we look at fuels is in the context of mobility, and we look at mobility in the context of, the, um, of this larger sort of energy picture. Coming, zeroing in a little bit closer to how we kind of look at the, uh, at the fuels challenge, I think there are kind of three broad areas and, and happy to take a deeper dive in, in, in any of the three. But I think one, and, and, and Dan kind of touched on it, but I would amplify it a little bit to say there are going to be multiple pathways over multiple time frames, over multiple geographies. So if you look at any one of the four or any of the subsets of the four that, that Dan talked about, some of, the, some of them are going to be very viable and, uh, and very real in the short term. Um, some of them are just now emerging. Gas to transport is certainly one of them, especially in the, uh, in the heavy truck and, uh, and marine uh, and, and rail uh, domain. If you look a little bit further out, next generation biofuels is, uh, is, is going to be you know, starting to, to emerge on the horizon. Uh, and, then, and then hydrogen perhaps even, even further out from that. Um, and so you, you look at the different pathways. Some of them will go in parallel. Some of them will go sequentially. And some of them will, will, will I think, take root um, more in some markets than they will in others. So that's, that's one. There is no silver bullet. There will be a mosaic of different solutions. Um, the, uh, the second uh, approach, I think, is, is, and you touched on it, is this, the collaboration piece. Uh, it's no accident that we've got somebody that really focuses on policy, somebody that really focuses on OEM and automotive um, side of the house, and somebody that focuses on the energy side of the house, because all three of those have to come together. Now, that's become sort of a truism. 
people have known that for quite a while. But I think what's starting to become even more interesting is that uh, when we talk about collaboration, uh, whether it's in the mobility space or the energy space uh, more generally, we're also starting to talk about collaboration across multiple other sectors, looking at water, looking at food, uh, looking at uh, information management. Uh, and uh, and there's, I think uh, you know, we're starting to become more and more aware that this is a system of, of uh, uh, you know, problem, challenge, opportunity, if you will, that, that we're looking at. Um, and the third thing I would say is that um, every prediction that we can make about the future will be wrong. Um, so one of the things that we need to be really cognizant of and really aware of is the need to be flexible enough and a need to be um, astute enough to be able to respond to any new development that it was completely unpredictable. Um, I think about things like um, the, the lit motors uh, display out here, the, the, the young kids that have come, kids, uh, I'm just aging myself, uh, but uh, the, 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 uh, this, this new company that uh, is developing this two-wheeled uh, car, and you think, okay, what potentially could that do in the, in the mobility space? What about things like uh, different forms of, uh, of urban planning and different forms of, uh, of, uh, of, of urban commuting? Um, what kind of technology breakthroughs may happen that we're simply not expecting now, but we need to be prepared to respond to and be able to address as an, as an energy company? So those are the three kind of broad areas that I would suggest are, uh, are useful to think about when we think about the energy or the mobility and future fuels uh, challenge. Great. Thank you. So now we have a sense that there are technologies out there and that these are viable technologies, um, but still it's not really happening. We haven't seen a lot of movement into the transportation sector in a large scale sense. Um, and even the projections suggest that we're our dependence on oil for transportation is only going to go down by a few percentage points over the next five years. So if there are cost obstacles, infrastructure obstacles, um, what are going to, what's going to change that? What is going to allow us to surmount those obstacles? And that gets us to, you know, to policy. Um, if natural gas has huge national security benefits because of our, our newfound uh, abundance of natural gas in this country, why isn't our government pushing that, giving it policy incentives to move into transportation or these infrastructure obstacles? You know, is Toyota really lobbying to get some kind of policy that will, will unleash you know, a building of the infrastructure that's necessary. Um, Dan, let me start with you, and maybe you can give us a sense of there's many, many energy policy debates happening right now. Which are most important to the transportation sector and to moving on some of these ideas that we've been discussing? Yeah, I guess I'd start out by saying the transition, getting from here to there, is turning out to be tremendously difficult. And Part of the reason is that there, we have such a huge investment, sunk investment in the way we do things now. There's so much inertia. And there aren't really a lot of constituencies out there for these new types of options. So the one area where there was a large constituency, corn ethanol, turned out to become a major industry, uh, partly because it was easy to do and partly because there's uh, two senators in many, of the, many farm states with two senators that have a lot of influence in Washington, and they were able to push through very strong policies to support ethanol. And I, if you think about it, we had actually, up until very recently, we had a strong mandate for ethanol and a large subsidy for ethanol. I mean, how many times do we have both mandates and, large mandates and subsidies you know, for, the, for something new? So there was a lot of political influence there. So we have this struggle of coming up with a policy framework for moving ahead. And the question is, what do we want to even favor as we move forward? So in many ways, the energy security and the climate policy and the air pollution have been linked pretty closely. And for most of these options, they all fit together, and that's been a good thing in terms of trying to get policy together. But we haven't made much progress. So at the national level, really the only thing we have is something called the Renewable Fuel Standard. And this is the, the ethanol, essentially an ethanol mandate. It's actually broader than that. It was supposed to be 36 billion gallons of biofuels by 2022. And what we have now is 13 billion gallons of corn ethanol and almost nothing of anything else. 
And so uh, somehow that policy has not worked real well. There's a major debate in Congress about how to, how to transform it, how to make it uh, re restructure it so that there's an incentive for innovation, an incentive to invest in these other options, um, but it's, it's stuck in Congress right now. So there's not a lot of progress on that. Probably the most, you know, okay, I'm coming from California. Um, I know I'm a little parochial, but <laughs> we have had the most uh, policy initiatives uh, actually by far in California. So in addition to that national, we have a low carbon fuel standard, which requires the oil companies to reduce the carbon intensity of their fuels by 10% by 2020. And 10% might not sound like a lot, but it is a lot because many of these fuels have maybe a 20% improvement or 30%. So that means you have to get 30% or 40% of the fuels being alternative fuels to meet this 10% requirement in 2020. So it's a, it's a very aggressive policy. There's lots of debate going on uh, between the different parties about that. Uh, it's been imitated by the European Union has something similar to that. British Columbia has something similar to that. Some other states are considering it. And then we have the other big one is the zero emission vehicle uh, mandate that California, it started it in 1990. It's uh, been a I, I guess I could call it a troubled policy. It's gone through a lot of incarnations, but just a, a couple of years ago, for the first time, it was strengthened. So every year after 1990, it kept getting watered down and, and weakened. And now, just a few years, two years ago, we started strengthening again. Can you say what, what it's supposed to so, do? So what it, the way it is now is it essentially requires that 15% of the vehicles sold in 10 years are are plug-in hybrids, battery electrics, or fuel cells. And it's not just, in this case, it's not just California. If it was just California, I think the car companies would be fine and happy and all would be well. But other states have adopted it. Nine other states have adopted it. Mostly New England, mid-Atlantic states have also adopted it. So it represents almost, almost a third of the US market now has this ZEV, ZEV zero emission vehicle mandate in place. And the numbers for that start cranking up uh, very, uh, fairly steeply in a couple of years. So the car companies are now uh, investing a lot of money in developing these zero emission vehicles. And that's one of the motivations behind the fuel cells also is that, uh, as JC said, who knows what the future is? You know, I've written all these books. I've been involved in it. I have no idea you know, how this is going to play out in the future. And so that's why these policies, so we're looking at policies that are more performance-based, market-based, and I know there's a little light on the market-based part of it, but, but the low carbon fuel standard has a credit trading provision to it, so that it does harness market forces, and we can get into the, you know, the regulatory versus market in a moment. But so we see, a, a, on the California side, we see a strong push and pull to move into these more advanced biofuels, electric vehicles. Uh, it's weaker in the rest of the country. There's different parts of the world that are pursuing it. Japan is pursuing electric vehicles uh, more aggressively than us, uh, and uh, Europe less than us, uh, with a few exceptions. So it's pretty, it's an interesting, you know, everyone's struggling with the same question, what kind of policies, and I think, you know, the big picture on policy is that we'd like to just say, just put a carbon tax out there or a, a gasoline tax. And the answer to that is number one, we'll never get the tax large enough to really make a difference because in the transportation sector, you need a big impetus. You know, you need a big tax or you need a big something uh, to, make, to change the behavior of both the suppliers as well as the consumers. So we're struggling right now. We've got a whole mix of, just like we don't know what the future is in terms of the fuels, uh, like Neil said, it's going to be a, you know, we all now say it's a portfolio approach. It's a, there's going to be a lot of different options, different places, different things. And the same thing with policy. It looks like it's going to be a mix of a lot of different policies. And, and what I say to the young people is, boy, we really need smart people going into government to manage this because it's going to get complicated to make sure we're doing policies that are working in concert and not, a, in, you know, not against each other, that there's not a big unintended consequences. 
And I know these two here are going to have very strong <laughs> opinions on the, this topic. <laughs> One of the things I want to bring out, Dan, in what you've just said, is that these policies thus far, with the exceptions of the biofuels, seem to be focusing on encouraging outcomes rather than betting on specific technologies, uh, or at least you know, the zero emissions fuel standard, those types of things, or car uh, uh, mandate, those would seem to leave open the door for any fuel that could get you to that outcome, which seems preferable than betting on a particular technology. Yeah, and I feel that, and I left that one policy actually is, is a really important one, and that is the, vehicle, the fuel economy uh, standards yeah. and the greenhouse gas standards for vehicles, because in a sense, that's the underlying policy for all of this. But it's looking, and, and it's very aggressive, we're calling for a doubling of fuel economy by 2025. These are rules in place for 54 miles per gallon by 2025. But what we're finding, and I think JC will confirm this, is that the auto industry, when they started focusing their resources on, uh, on their people and their resources on meeting that, have been making tremendous progress. And they're finding that they can meet that standard mostly with conventional technology, lightweight vehicles, better engines, without having to go to electric vehicles. And so that, that's why, at least in California, we've come to think this zero emission vehicle program is really important as a way of kick-starting this advanced technology on top of the more broad-based performance standard for vehicles. So JC. Give us the. <laughs> we, 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 we've had we've had Dan been talking about the automotive industry, I'll but uh, you, you'll get the opportunity to respond here. How, how have these policies influenced what Toyota is doing, uh, or the automotive industry in general? And is it useful? Is it providing an impetus that you think is helpful, or is it directing your investment into places that you would otherwise not not put it? That's a big question. <laughs> So, uh, as Dan said, the, um, meeting the, the almost doubling of corporate um, average fleet economy in 12 years, 13 years, is, is a big challenge, but we, we do think that we can meet that um, without any, quote, advanced technologies other than hybrids. Um, so, you know, more efficient internal combustion engines, um, hybrids, I mean, our, our plan, and um, I'm not sure that we're that different from other um, automakers who are doing this, looking at this, is that, um, our plan is to introduce more hybrids across more models and different vehicle segments. So we think that we can, um, or our plan on reaching that is, is through hybrids and advanced internal combustion, um, such that we don't need zero emission, these zero emission vehicles. Um, you know, he, we've, forgot, for, forgot which one of you said it, but you talked about, you know, in 13 years, 15% of all new vehicle sales will be yep. battery electric plug-in hybrid fuel cells. And again, I just want to, sort of bring back the comment I made earlier, which is after 13 years, I mean, that's the same time horizon, hybrids are only 3% of the market. So how, how do we expect that we're gonna you know, triple that, um, quintuple that history, that history of vehicle adoption um, without strong policy or, or incentives? Um, so you're saying the standard is not sufficient to drive that 15% in your view, that, that zero emissions mandate is not strong enough no, the standard is strong enough. <laughs> the mandate yeah. is strong enough. Oh, you'd like a stronger one. <laughs> uh, the, um, the mandate's definitely strong enough. We actually think that it's, um, you know, that it's perhaps too aggressive in, in, the, in what, the market, um, what the market can deliver um, in terms of vehicle adoption. And I've forgotten what other question you asked me. <laughs> you did ask just about, about the, how policy is affecting where Toyota puts its investments sure. and how it makes its decisions. Sure. Um, I would say, in terms of hybrids, that was not affected by policy. We were developing um, hybrids 20 years ago, 25 years ago, um, and that was just part of our own corporate-wide, um, co you know, global citizen. To um, part of our Part of we feel our environmental responsibility is to protect the planet, protect our resources, um, conserve resources. So we were, you know, developing hybrids before there were any policies um, such as these in place. Um, you made a really good, or you asked a really good question, and I, I did, it did come back to me now. And this is that question of, are we committing resources um, toward a policy or for technology toward a policy that we could um, invest elsewhere? And I would say that's definitely the case with, uh, with the 
I'm sorry, Dan, with the uh, <laughs> zero emission vehicle technologies is that um, we do see much more opportunity in hybrids, even though I, I talked about how difficult um, it has been to, to reach the total market. I mean, we, we have been successful. We, that, 10, 11 percent of our total sales are hybrids. So we think there's more opportunity. We, we, um, that's our plan to get to CAFE. We are investing a ton of money um, in the zero emission vehicle technologies that, that we think could be better spent um, investing in putting hybridization, hybrids in more, in more vehicle models. And you also asked about earlier about um, infrastructure and you know, what role we're playing and are we, are we lobbying for policies. Um, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, you know, our, our philosophy was just, our, our job is just to make the best darn cars out there, the most, you know, the highest quality, most reliable. Um, we're just, we're a car company, fuel is not our business. Um, but it's having to become our business um, very quickly in order to support these, support these policies. And so um, that's one thing that we are um, working internally on is, is increasing that, um, policy aspect of these vehicles and whether that's lobbying for infrastructure. We, we were just in Sacramento um, last week talking about the um, state effort to put in hydrogen infrastructure. So we, so we are getting more involved in, in that because we, because we need to. Great. Thank you. Neil, um, I think it's probably fair to say if you asked Americans just generally about the relationship of the oil and gas industry to some of the technologies and advances that we'd like to see in transportation with alternative fuels that most Americans would say the oil and gas industry works against these policies, is interested in the status quo. Um, but we've also heard from Shell over the course of this Ideas Festival how you use scenarios not just to try to game out what you need to do to keep the industry as it is, but to anticipate what the future is going to look like. So can you say a little bit about how Shell sees the future in this arena in terms of policy and what it means in terms of your decision making. Yeah, I'm happy to do that. And let me, let me do that as a coda on three points that I would, I would use to build up to that based on what, uh, what Dan said. And by the way, it's no surprise that, uh, that Dan just recently won a, a very significant global award for yes. the work that he's done on policy. As, uh, I can't imagine too many people that are smarter on the topic than, uh, than Daniel is. And I do have a strong opinion. but we don't write <laughs> Uh, so you took the words right up. No, no. The, uh, but but do have a strong opinion, and it may surprise you, which is that uh, my 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 first point: uh, policy is absolutely essential in this space, and and good policy, robust policy. Uh, robust regulation, all the things that you mentioned, market-based, fair, level playing field, designed to get to an outcome rather than pick winners and losers, all those things are essential. And we can have debates on how to improve um, or to, to tweak policies, but, uh, but generally that's absolutely essential to, uh, to, to moving forward uh, in this space, I think. And, um, and where policy doesn't do the trick, companies like Shell actually take, uh, take it on ourselves, for example, to put a, a price of carbon internally on, uh, on, on uh, uh, the projects that, uh, that we're developing, um, you know, absent in, 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 in expectation that there's going to be a price on carbon externally. So that's number one, uh, policy regulation, absolutely essential. Um, I think number two, though, is one of the things that, that does get in the way, and this is going to sound a little bit like an excuse, but it, one of the things that gets away in the way of some of the really exciting potential changes that we can see in the fuels and the mobility space is just the scale of the challenge. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a flavor for, for what that is, uh, Shell alone has 43,000 retail sites around the world. That's more retail sites than McDonald's has stores. We serve 10 million customers every day. We refuel an airplane about every 10 seconds. So I say that not to brag about the size of Shell, it's simply to say just Shell's little piece of this whole mobility uh, uh, kind of scheme around the world is, uh, is a small piece and, you, and you, you magnify that by several fold and you get to the, the sheer size of the infrastructure. The billion or so vehicles that are on the road today could become uh, three billion by uh, uh, the middle of the century. Uh, now you're talking big scale and to move that kind of scale, to move that kind of infrastructure is a, is a, is a major challenge. So we just kind of need to keep that in, in mind. Having said that, the third point I would make is that, that despite all that, 
there should be absolutely no impediment to companies like mine, and, and I know Toyota does this and, and many others, looking for opportunities to move ahead anyway. So whether it's in biofuels, the, the work that, uh, just, just as an example, the work that Shell does with, uh, with sugarcane-based biofuels in Brazil, a $12 billion JV that we have there on sugarcane-based biofuels, the work that we're doing now on liquid natural gas to transport in the, in, the, in the heavy truck industry. We've got three agreements, three green corridors that we have planned one around the, uh, the, the Gulf Coast, one around the Great Lakes, one in Canada uh, with uh, small-scale liquefaction plants and customers already uh, in place ready to take liquid natural gas as fuel for heavy trucks, uh, barges, marine. We're using liquid natural gas in our own operation uh, to replace diesel. So there are things that we can be doing now and are doing now and that car companies are doing and, and small entrepreneurial companies are doing. Coming back to your point around scenarios, and it really kind of comes to the, to, the, to the point I made earlier about all predictions being wrong. Um, if you try to plan a business around a particular expectation that this, this path is going to emerge or this particular solution is going to be the right one or eight track tapes are going to be the wave of the future, you're probably going to get it wrong. So one of the ways we try to tackle that, uh, that challenge is, is, is in, and some of you may have heard about it over the last couple of days, is looking at a range of possible outcomes, looking at, uh, at what kind of trajectory we may see in terms of technologies, in terms of economy, in terms of climate, uh, in terms of politics. Um, and one of the things that, that we do that's maybe a little different than the way other people, especially in our industry, look at it is we take an even broader view, not just of you know, the technical or the policy or the, or the commercial sort of um, uh, guesses as to what the future may entail, but also social, cultural, economic. Uh, what are that, what, what do those, that range of possibilities look like? And if you can kind of paint competing visions of the future, uh, in our case, we've, we've named them even, mountains and oceans. If you, if you look at competing visions of the future, you have a better sense of where are the trade-offs that we might have to make. What are the things that we might need to expect if the world goes down this path versus down this path? And that boils right down to things like fuels, things like mobility. Um, I would also say just one last thing, because you, you raised the, uh, the point about um, fuel, uh, fuel companies and, uh, and auto companies. Um, <coughs> intriguing to, to, to hear JC talk about you know, kind of Toyota becoming a fuel company, sort of in the same way that Shell is becoming a, a mobility company. Because increasingly there's this, this awareness that you can't solve the well-to-tank problem of, of fuels without looking at what that tank to wheels uh, uh, kind of element of, uh, of the fuels challenge is all about. And if you're not linking those two things together, if you're not looking at how to optimize that relationship all the way across the, uh, the, 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 the life cycle of the fuel, then you're probably not going to get anywhere. So you know, getting over some of the, the, the past tensions, which have basically been chicken and the egg tensions, right? So you know, would we like to produce a lot of hydrogen? Yeah, sure, but only if there are customers for it. Would you like us to, uh, to, to make hydrogen-based uh, vehicles? Yeah, sure, but only if there's a hydrogen rate. So that's kind of where it comes from. But we've got to get past that and, and look at ways to, uh, to, to, to find the synergies. Great, thank you. Um, I'd like to ask one last question before opening up to the audience for questions, and I'll, I'll direct it to Dan. You made the point about we're finding it very difficult to find the policy pathway. Uh, could you say a word about other countries? So we've had a very U.S.-focused conversation, but have other countries done a better job of finding this policy path forward? Um, I'd say some countries have made, moved forward in different areas. So Brazil with ethanol, and they had their sugarcane industry. Uh, Japan is moving a little more aggressively on electric vehicles. Um, Europe has more aggressive uh, performance standards for the CO2 performance standards for vehicles. It's not necessarily leading to them investing more quickly in advanced technology, but they are improving. They, are, they do have tighter requirements on the conventional, which will presumably lead to advanced technology soon. So I, in a policy sense, I'd say probably not. We're, no one's doing a good job. But I would say, if I looked at it again from an industry perspective, you know, I get, as I was explaining to Neil before, you know, the good thing about being a professor is you're not accountable to anyone. Uh, <laughs> I have no bosses in the audience. <laughs> you know, I would characterize that the automobile, today, the automobile industry is making a massive investment in, in more efficient technology and advanced technology. And that is not happening in the oil industry, that Shell is, is clearly the, the leading company in the oil 
industry in terms of its commitment to sustainability and, and, and really is committed. But if you generalize across the industry, it's moving very slowly and in fact playing a very uh, aggressive role in opposing most of these policies that we're talking about. So that's part of the challenge we're facing now is how do you figure out for the oil industry what's a business model for them that makes sense where they can be part of the solution. And you know, Shell has come up with some good ideas and they're doing some good things, but overall we're running into real problems you know, with the industry broadly. Uh, actually, I'll give Neil a chance to respond to that. <laughs> but let me just ask you, you didn't mention China. You said Japan, uh, Brazil, the EU. What about China? Um, we hear that this is going to be a, a space where the Chinese really want to be a global leader. They have the same fuel du jour problem that we do. <laughs> uh, they have, they really pushed hard on uh, electric vehicles. They've created a lot of incentives and, and a lot of the cities have put in even additional pol policies and incentives, but they've not been making good progress. The consumer market just is not moving forward on electric vehicles, but there is a lot of focus now increasingly on the bus market because they have a lot more buses than we do. And buses, of course, use lots of energy. <coughs> So there is, a lot of, there is a lot of electrification happening for the, uh, the buses, buses in China, and that is uh, something pretty notable. Yeah, because certainly the Chinese, I think they understand, if they move forward on the same path that Western economies did in terms of personal vehicles, that it just will be unsustainable in terms of space, pollution, and, and energy. Um, Neil, do, do you want to respond to Dan well, before I open up? <laughs> <laughs> No, I think uh, uh, I would say a couple things. One is um, one of the conundrums that we look at, whether we're looking through a scenarios approach uh, as an energy company or whether we're, we're, we're looking at, uh, at, at, the, at our portfolio of, of capital is um, what is the right balance between servicing the infrastructure and the portfolio we have now and driving or enabling kind of future solutions, if you will. Um, so kind of what our shareholders expect us to do, obviously, is meet this, this, uh, this enormous demand of kind of the current uh, uh, kind of fuels that are available, but also you know, find ways to keep moving towards, a, uh, towards competitiveness in a future market. I would add to that that one of the things that, uh, that we need to be aware of is, is uh, making sure that we're not so focused on the long-term best possible solution that we miss the opportunity to, to take advantage of the current good solution. So here again, I come back to gas. Um, so eventually, I think you know, a lot of people in this room, myself included, would like to see you know, a hydrogen economy at some point in the future. It f just feels like that's probably the right end game. It's going to be a long time getting there. What do we do? Do we just kind of wait in the, in the kind of the crude oil for based uh, economy until we get there? No, I think the, 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 the wave of gas gives us the opportunity to uh, reduce costs, reduce CO2 emissions, uh, and, uh, and have a much cleaner burning um, mobile, uh, mobility fuel in that interim as we start to you know, understand a little bit better what the opportunities are longer term. So it's that, what, what I was talking about earlier, sequential pathways rather than necessarily always parallel pathways. Um, and, um, and then I'd like to come back to the kind of the point you were making about uh, sort of the global picture, and, and probably you're the best expert on this panel when it comes to, to geopolitics. But one of the things that we're looking at closely is, is exports and imports of, of energy uh, out of North America into North America. Uh, lots of buzz these days about uh, you know, North America potentially becoming self-sufficient in, uh, in, in, in you know, energy you know, by uh, 2021 or, or thereabouts. And I think one of the debates that's clearly going on and that, uh, that we need to come to grips with is what makes sense in terms of, uh, of, a, of a global market for energy and, and, uh, and exporting energy versus importing and taking best advantage of uh, refinery uh, infrastructure and so forth. Uh, and that could open up, uh, you know, even in the space of, of how, we, how we make policy around uh, mobile, mobility fuels, that could open up a, a, a quite a Pandora's box. Let me um, turn to you and take your questions and comments. I'll begin with you over here, please. Hi, uh, I think we're, are we going to, yes. I think they're recording, so it's helpful, even if you've got a strong voice, to have a microphone. Hi, my name is Vanessa, and this question is directed um, towards Neil. So, you know, you're talking about mobility and, you know, not predicting the future, and then you also mentioned that, you know, that it's kind of crazy to produce fuel out of food. So I want to bring the question as far as like using mushrooms, like fungi, which can create like cellulose, which is a cheap catalyst, it can clean up the land. 
So I'm just wondering, like, what is Shell doing as far as um, scientific innovations for future research? I'm thinking about what we used mushrooms for back in the 70s, but it was uh, <laughs> much, <laughs> much, much different. Um, no, so I think uh, I think uh, one of the things so. You know, Biofuels by itself has sort of this sequential sort of stages of, uh, of, of development. And, and right now, uh, you know, the, the biofuel that, that we see has the most potential is in, in the one that's currently available, clearly sugarcane. It, 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 it's the most sustainable available uh, biofuel feedstock at the moment. However, in the JV that I, uh, that I um, commented on earlier, this, this, uh, this Ryzen, that's the name of the, the, the company in Brazil that, we've, that we formed with, uh, with Cozan, um, sugarcane company, we put into that um, all of our, uh, a lot of our R&D around what does the future of biofuels look like? What are the different feedstocks that we, we can use? It might be mushrooms, although I haven't heard about that pathway yet, uh, but certainly um, other pathways, other feedstocks, cellulosic. Uh, uh, we already use the bagasse from, uh, from uh, sugarcane cultivation to, to generate power for the, for the mills that are creating ethanol uh, in Brazil. Um, we've explored algae, we've explored um, um, you know, taking uh, wood chips and converting them directly through, uh, through uh, uh, various chemical processes and physical processes into fuels. So there are a number of different pathways even in the biofuel space and any one of those could potentially emerge into something that's pretty exciting in the future. But once again, it's making sure that we're not overlooking what's good now in favor of what's even better in the future. We need to take care of both of those stages of the development. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, here up front. Hi. Uh, Could you, would you mind oh, waiting for the microphone? It's coming your way. I guess there's some logic to moving across. <laughs> the um, donuts are a question about hydrogen. It's a wonderful fuel on the back end, but it takes a lot of energy to separate it by hydrolysis. And that hasn't really been talked about, and isn't that a major downside to the use of hydrogen? Now, there may be other ways of separating hydrogen out of water or separating it out of methane, but I'd be interested in hearing about how to bring the cost of producing hydrogen down. It also blows up rather easily, so uh, it's not so easy to transport. So maybe you could address those problems. Who would like to take that? Well, I'll, I'll take a stab, and then Dan's probably got more, more in his, his, his bag of tricks on that. First of all, I, I, it's, I think... Uh, you have to address the blowing up thing first. Yeah, the, oh, I thought I'd let you do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think one of the, with hydrogen or with any other form of fuel, one of the things that we, whether it's electric or, or biofuels, it's, it's you know, what is the, 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 the total life cycle impact of any fuel? Uh, and uh, you know, as attractive as hydrogen is, certainly on a tank to wells and potentially on a on a well to wheels basis, uh, it does matter where the hydrogen comes from and how you get it. Uh, one of the reasons why we're not already heading pell mell, one of many reasons that we're not already heading pell mell into a hydrogen economy, is we haven't quite figured out what is the best, most sustainable, least energy intensive, least carbon intensive, and most commercially viable way to create enough hydrogen to make a real impact in the, uh, in the, in the mobility space. Working on it, and, and the car companies are working on it, and, uh, and, and many others are, but the point that you make is, is absolutely essential. But I would only say it's not just hydrogen, it's biofuels and looking at the life cycle impact of biofuels, it's conventional fossil fuels and looking at the life cycle impact. Uh, you know, that's, that's, I think, at the basis in, in electricity, which, uh, which of course uh, has lots of potential, but again, where does the electricity come from? That has to be looked at at any of the range of, uh, of options that Dan talked about at the very beginning. So the specific answer would be, um, in the near term, we'll be making it from mostly from uh, natural gas. And when you do that, you still come out with a, CO, with a uh, greenhouse gas impact about half of what a Prius would be. So it's still a very large improvement because the fuel cell is so efficient. Uh, as we go further, so making it from water is, is probably quite a ways down ahead. It might not even be one of the major ways of doing it. And when you go really far in the future, you can, there's a lot of breeding of plants where they can produce hydrogen directly. There's another option actually is take coal. You gasify it and make the hydrogen and then you have a very clean stream of CO2 that comes out. You can sequester it and 
actually you end up with a near zero emission system using coal. And actually that might be the lowest cost option of all and, and a very attractive one. So there's a lot of uh, ways to do it. And you know, going back to what Neil said, we don't want to let the perfect get in the way of the good. And so there's a transition process here. If we keep thinking it has to be perfect from the get-go, we're not going to move forward. Yes, right here. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Giving you your I'm exercise trying to today. Follow your policy. <laughs> so, Dan, my question to you is this: um, First of all, I'd like to get your perspective on the changing dynamic or the dynamics of the battery side in terms of cost. And performance and how you see that happening. And number two is no one's talked about the relationship between the intermittent nature of renewable energy and the storage uh, capacity of electric vehicles and, and how those two things might work in harmony together for a better future. So if you could sort of give us some thoughts on that, it'd be great. Yeah, there is a lot of interest in thinking about how to connect the vehicle to the house, to the local grid, to the larger grid, and use it as part of the storage medium. And you can do the same thing with hydrogen, actually, because it's, it's the same process, because it's a, you're converting hydrogen into electricity, and you can store the electricity uh, as well that way. So um, there's a lot of appeal to it. There's a lot of there's some issues in actually doing it in terms of the grid for safety reasons, but it looks like a very attractive option, probably as emergency backup because there is the, elect the electricity grid, they pay it, spend a lot of money to have that little, that have that, uh, that surplus capacity for those few days a year when, when there's high temperatures, air conditioning, so into the You're grid. I'm thinking of just that you have a lot of, like for instance, wind blowing at night. Oh, know, the intermittent. Your, 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 yeah, the intermittent issue in holding that, you know, you're parking. I have an electric car, so, you know, I put it in my garage. I plug it in at night, you know. It, the wind's blowing out in West Texas at night. You know, putting those two together it seems to make sense. Well, it does help in terms of load, you know, leveling the load and load management because you can charge it at, you know, the timer. Even now, even now the chargers, you can set them to charge at different times. So that's very attractive. The battery part of it is the, the battery costs. So the question was about cost, right? And how, you know, what's the trend line? Yeah, the batteries have been steadily improving. I mean, when I started getting interest in electric vehicles in 1990, we were using lead acid batteries and NICAD, nickel cadmium batteries. And, and you know, then we moved to metal, uh, nickel metal hydride batteries that Toyota really did a great job with on the Prius. And now it's lithium batteries, and there's so many types of lithium technologies, and, and I think that's going to play out for quite a few years, continuing improvements, both in terms of the manufacturing side uh, as well as the chemistry of it. So, I, you know, it's looking very good, but, you know, it, it, part of what you were asking also is how this is going to play out. And I think the plug-in hybrids are going to be the more dominant technology for quite a while in the United States because we are so sprawled out, we do travel so much. Uh, in a dense city, then a pure battery EV makes a lot of sense. But for the kind of travel patterns we have, um, the, and, and the question then becomes, there's a lot of questions, how big a battery do you want? How do you design it? But I think that's going to be the more dominant one for the next. So I'll add, just add to the battery, unless you want to go to another question. No, no, actually we're getting close to okay. the end of time, but please have the, the last word. <laughs> I just wanted to um, add to the battery, did my microphone just come on, um, add to the battery um, answer, which is that we, um, as, as Dan said, we're actually one of the largest battery manufacturers today with, our, um, with Panasonic. Um, so we've been able to you know, squeeze those efficiencies over the, over the decades from um, nickel metal hydride batteries, and we'll continue to do that with lithium ion, um, but we, we don't see it. So we do see improvement, but it's going to, we see evolutionary improvement, but is there going to be you know, a, a, such a drastic cost reduction that it's going to be able to be cost competitive with a conventional vehicle. No, we don't see that happening. So we also are investing heavily in um, sort of what we're calling beyond lithium. So we have an advanced battery lab. It's, so it's still, um, you know, if, if we do invent something in, in our lab for uh, beyond lithium, um, it's, it's going to take 
you know, anywhere from 10 to 20 years to get that to scale. So for the next, um, for, for the foreseeable future, we're, you know, lithium ion will be the battery of choice. Well, thank you. I hope those of you who came here hoping to get some investment tips have walked away with a few <laughs> ideas, but certainly we've all got a better sense of the complexity of the challenges and the need for technology, strategy, and policy uh, to get us to where we need to go in the future. So please join me in thanking our panelists.